Greetings to all participants, and it's a very great opportunity for me to be here. I'm Varun Pond Pratihom, a faculty from Zhuanggong University. Uh, and today, I'm sure that gait disorders are common problems that general practitioners and neurologists face every day. So let's find out how to examine patients with gait disorders together in my talk, how to examine patients with gait disorders. To declare my conflict of interest, I received a PhD grant from the Second Century Fan Zhuanggong University. And before I give a talk about gait disorder, you have to understand about human gait and balance first. Human gait is a complex rhythmical and cyclical movement. It is controlled by a chain of movement disorders, a chain of command from cortex, basal ganglia, brainstem, spinal cord, and then peripheral nervous system. And what about the balance? Balance is the ability to maintain stance without falling or excessive blushing, which depends on multiple factors, including the vision, proprioception, vestibular sensation, and good motor control. After we understand the definition, we'll have to understand the pathophysiology. This will enable us to correlate and understand more about the clinical manifestation. As I say that gait is controlled by chain of command from the central and peripheral nervous system. First, uh, when we want to walk, we we'll have to know where to go and then we initiate the walk from the frontal cortex, which then sends the signal to the mesencephalic locomotor region in the midbrain and then send the signals to the pons here then goes to the spinal cord. After that, the signal when they descend to peripheral nervous system and activate the gait or locomotion. This correlates with classification of gait abnormalities. Abnormalities of frontal area will contribute to highest level gait disorder, including the frontal gait disorder, the cautious gait, the psychotonic gait, and then the abnormalities of brainstem, including the midbrain and the pons, and also the spinal cord will contribute to the middle level gait disorders. And then the abnormalities of the peripheral nervous system will contribute to the lowest level gait disorders, including the steppish gait and the rattling gait. So we'll talk about these abnormalities later on. Next, let's move on how to examine the gait disorders. We have already understood how gait abnormalities occur, which will contribute to what we should notice in gait examination. So in this topic, we'll focus on three topics, including the basic knowledge of gait examination, the details we should focus on, and the differential diagnosis. For the basic knowledge of gait examination, you have to know that steps of examination begins with sitting, quite standing, walking straight for about three meters to evaluate the standard time up and go taste, then advise the patient to turn and then walk back to the chair. What is the time up and go taste I mentioned? The time up and go taste is as its name, the standard time which patient stands up and walk. So we measure this as an objective gait measurement. Uh, it's a representative for gait measurement. So uh, you can also advise the patients to perform the spatial taste if needed, including walking backward, doing tasking like counting the numbers while walking, or walking through the narrow passage. I'll have to emphasize that details of each step can be used to differentiate between disease and gait disorders. And now, what details should we focus on? We learn about 
the gate examination, the normal gate examination. Now, what details should we focus on? Well, we are going to the abnormalities of each step. First, we are going to these two steps. At the sitting position and quiet standing, we'll have to monitor for the posture, balance, and motor activity. What abnormalities would we detect in these first two steps? The abnormalities include postural abnormalities or the postural abnormalities of head and trunk, which can be best observed when patients sit or stand. Then let's see the differential diagnosis based on the abnormalities detected. You can tell the diagnosis of patient at first glance on the chair when they come into your examination room. The common postural abnormalities of head include backward dropping of head or retrocolis and forward dropping of head or we call it anticolis. The picture on the left here demonstrate the retrocolis. When we found retrocolis on examination, the common differential diagnosis should include the PSP, of course. Uh, however, there are other lists of differential diagnosis as in the blue box here, and we'll talk about this later on. So what about anticolis? what we would think of when the patients have anticholis. The common differential diagnosis should include the atypical Parkinsonism, especially the MSA, and also the other neuromuscular diseases like uh, the LS or the myasthenia gravis also have the probabilities to have anticholis also. But please note that patients should have lower motor neuron type weakness or other specific signs along with anticholis if you suspect ALS or myasthenia gravis. Another thing to be considered is to differentiate between anticholis and stool posture. Or if the stooping is severe, we call it the camptochromia. As you see in the two pictures on the right, anticholis is considered when abnormalities are observed above C7 level of the spine and stool posture are below. Why you have to differentiate this? Because the differential diagnosis and the treatment are different. Anticholis is mostly found in MSA or other neuromuscular disease, like in the middle picture, while stool posture is mostly found in PD. The postural abnormalities can be found at the trunk also. If patients lean sideways in abnormal degree, we call this the PISA syndrome. This can be found in advanced PD and a typical Parkinsonism. Some patients with musculoskeletal problem can present with the PISA syndrome also. Like patients with scoliosis or other vertebral abnormalities. So uh, it, it has been listed here about the other differential diagnosis of the PISA syndrome. But the typical diagnosis you should mention is the Parkinson's disease. And what about the drifting backwards? Of course, we'll have to suspect for opis totonos, which may be caused from what we know tetanus or some types of poisoning. This can be found in a typical Parkinsonism like PSP and PD also. Another thing to be noted is that you see that drugs can cause all the postural abnormalities, especially uh, the drugs in the type of the dopamine blocker or neuroleptic drugs. You see that it will be listed in all the postural abnormalities. Definitely, the frequently asked questions include how we should differentiate pathological postural abnormalities with normal variants in elderly. Recently, there is a consensus on Standard Movement Disorder Society Task Force. This demonstrates degree of normal variance and the pathological abnormalities. If the degree of abnormalities are low, 
elderly patients tend to have normal variants. All of you can follow the reference for the exact degree and further details. So if the abnormalities are severe, we'll consider they are having real postural instability, uh, postural abnormalities, sorry. So what about the other abnormalities that can be detected in this first two steps? The other abnormalities include the abnormalities of balance and motor activity. When the patient rises from the chair, the abnormalities can be divided into reckless rising or slow rising. Reckless rising can be found in PSP as known as the rocket sign in the left video. You see that this patient, when he tries to lift up from the chair, rise up from the chair, he fell back into a chair when attempted without attributed caution. However, in the right video, you see that this patient has slow rising caused by his proximal muscle weakness, or if extreme, it can also be found as gout sign in muscular dystrophy like in the right video. Other factors can also confound the rise of patients, such as musculoskeletal problems or pain. Now we are moving to the abnormalities in the four steps here. Before we go to the abnormalities in that four steps, you have to know about the gait cycle. You can compare the demo, demo picture at the first row with the real video at the second row, the gait cycle starts with stand phase and ends with swing phase. Stand phase is when any feet contact with the floor, and the swing phase is when any feet is in the air. In the stand phase, the first step is the heel strike and the beginning of the gait initiation. Then the foot is fully contact to the floor and ends with toe off. So what we would monitor in the stance phase, we can evaluate the stance width, which is divided into narrow base and wide base gait. Other things we can evaluate is the step length and the stride length. The step length is the distance between right and left feet here, and the stride length is the distance between the same step, like in this figure. In the swing phase, the abnormalities can be detected in the arm swing. So next, what details should we focus on? These four steps here. When patient walks straight, turns and walks right back to the chair, we'll have to monitor details as listed, which are correlated with the gait cycle I have previously mentioned. The special test can be performed if you don't see the abnormalities in the basic examination. So what abnormalities can be detected? They're listed as followings. So let's see the details of abnormalities for the differential diagnosis. And the first one is the freezing of gait. Abnormalities of gait initiation, maintenance, and termination can be observed as freezing of gait. So freezing of gait is defined as a brief episodic inability to generate effective steps despite the intention to walk. It doesn't occur all the time and has various clinical manifestation depends on the provoked situation. Like when patients are at the start, turning, approaching the target, or if severe patients can have freezing when they walk in an open space. This spectrum of presentations can be found in PD or frontal gait disorders. So now we are moving to the second abnormalities, the abnormal stance width. Abnormalities of stance width can be divided into wide-based and narrow-based gait. 
like I've mentioned in the previous slide. White-based gait can be found in cerebellar ataxia. You will also notice that there are dysmetria of each step, but it is consistent in all of his steps. Patients with NPH in the second video also has white-based gait, but you'll notice that the step is a little bit short and she hardly lifts her feet from the floor. The most important thing in the second video is the arm swing is normal. You see that her arm swing is normal. So we call this the lower half Parkinsonism. The next video is the patient with MSA or a typical Parkinsonism. He has wide base gait, but the difference is that you see that this patient had postural instability in the medial lateral plane, like um, some speakers mentioned in the previous session. Patients with PD have narrow base gait to compensate their postural instability in anterior posterior plane. And the last video is the patients with spastic gait. You see that they have narrow base gait due to their muscle spasms. Now let's move to the third abnormalities, the abnormal steps. They can be divided into reduced step height, increased step height, and irregular or asymmetrical cadence. Reduced step height can be found in Parkinsonian or frontal gait like this because patients have ready or sometimes hypokinesia. It can also be found in neuropathic gait like this video in which patients have weakness so they cannot lift their feet from the floor and the step height is reduced. However, the increased step height can also be found in Cori gait here. An example is a levodopa induced dyskinesia as known as the silly walk. You'll see that this patient has stamping with high step height and also that his arm swing is also increased. For the last video is the patient with the cerebellar ataxia. You will note that this patient has irregular or asymmetrical hardens, or you see that the steps of the patients is very irregular, which can be found in cerebellar ataxia. Sometimes this type of abnormalities is also found in patients with psychotonic gait. Now we are in the fourth abnormality, the abnormal arm swing. The abnormalities of arm swing can be divided into decreased and increased arm swing. Decreased arm swing can be found in Parkinsonian or dystonic gait. You see here in this video. Uh, the, video, uh, the first video on the left is the patients with Parkinsonian gait, and you see that there is a symmetrical arm swing. This is a patient with dystonic gait. You see that her foot had abnormal posturing, and her elbow is hardly flexed with a type of dystonic gait. So you'll see that this patient will have decreased arm swing. So for the increased arm swing, it can be found in levodopa-induced dyskinesia here, or even in psychotonic gait. Okay. And the last abnormalities, abnormalities in movement fluidity. Movement fluidity can be divided into decreased and increased fluidity. Decreased fluidity can be found in stiff gait, as in stiff person syndrome. You see that this patient is walking with rigidity. It can also be found in Parkinsonian gait, as PD patients also have rigidity. What about increased fluidity? The increased fluidity can be found in psychotonic gait, as known as the type of knee bucklings. This is a sign which is very specific to psychotonic gait. And increased fluidity can also be found in other types of gait, like the Trendy-Lemberg gait. 
the patients have fluidity of pelvis when they walk because they have proximal muscle weakness. Before the end of the examination, physicians can perform additional tests as shown. It supports the disease you suspect. The rumble test is performed by patients moving the feet side to side, folding the arms to the chest, eyes closed. This test will elicit sensory ataxia. The next test in the, is the tandem gait, which is performed as shown on second video from the left. The tests can be impaired in patients with medial lateral instability, such as a typical Parkinsonism and ataxia. Walking backward can be used in dystonic gait to elicit task-specific dystonia and functional gait to demonstrate inconsistency. Also, walking rapidly can also be used in patients to provoke fitting. So how do we apply the gait examination into the detection of gait abnormalities, as I previously mentioned? This consists of the highest, the middle level, and the lowest gait disorders. Some are previously discussed, but I'll mention the common gait disorders and what we should observe to recognize each type of gait disorders. This is an example of how to put each fragment of observation into the whole picture. The first example is the frontal gait disorder. Patient will have wide base gait, decreased step length, and they hardly lift the feet from the fall. Or we call this the magnetic gait. The most important thing is the arm swing is normal. All of these are features of frontal gait disorder, which we'll go through this topic in the next section. Another example is the middle level gait disorder, the Parkinsonian gait, the common middle level gait disorder. In the sitting and standing position, patient may have stool posture here. When they walk, they may have freezing. When they start, the gait is low. And also the gait has narrow base and reduced in step height. There is also a decreased or asymmetrical arm swing, which can be observed like in the last video here. You can see that every features I've previously mentioned is looking into the whole picture as in this side. After observation of every features, then you can decide that this patient has Parkinsonian gait. Another example is the ataxic gait. As you see in the videos, patients will have wide base gait, irregular cadence, and also impaired tandem gait. Ataxia can be divided into cerebellar and sensory ataxia. And we can exclude these two disorders using the Romberg test. If the Romberg test is positive, which means that Patient tends to fall after they close their eyes. You should suspect sensory ataxia. The next one is the step page gait. You see that this patient has reduced step height and her hip and knee is excessively flexed because she hardly lifts her feet from the floor, from the weakness. So this is the character of the step page gait. And this is the lowest level of the gait disorders. So for my conclusion, gait examination should always be performed in patients with neurological disorders. It can tell us many diseases. And you see that there are steps of examination, including from sitting, standing, walking, and turn. Careful observation is a key to differentiate disease with gait examination. So when you examine patients with gait disorders, I suggest that you should carefully observe details of each phase and put them together into the whole picture. This will lead you to the differential diagnosis and prompt management of the patients. In the next section, we'll have discussion on various cases of gait disorders so that you can understand more about each type of the gait disorders based on the cases. Thank you for your attention.
thank you dr warren pon puen paton for very interesting uh, presentation with uh, many uh, video um in this presentation uh, dr warren pon uh, give us uh, two level of uh, great resource the uh, highest uh, middle and lowest and uh, we have uh, two topic to uh, examine so please uh, dear colleagues uh, we have a um, few minutes to uh, give her a quick question or comments please yes please propose uh, Very nice session, and I think that you put a lot of um, good videos and examples. It's clearly seen. Um, it's not really the question, but I just want to point out that uh, what we see on when patients walk to us is not just only the abnormalities of the underlying disorder, but it's actually the compensatory mechanism that their patients actually try to compensate with. I think one of the good examples is the y best gate that you see that. Um, um, is actually patient try to compensate it. Um, so my question, um, not really the question, so maybe you could comment that um, when approaching um, patient with gay disorder in which we could have cases to discuss, to tease out what is actually the abnormalities, what is actually the compensatory, mechan uh, uh, compensatory mechanism or even the aspect of fear of falling that the patient manifests when they, you know, uh, manifest themselves. I think it's quite important when planning for the uh, treatment. You want to mention about that a bit? Yes. Uh, thank you, Professor, for a very good question. Uh, some, like, like Professor has said, that some patients may have compensation, uh, which means that it's not the real abnormalities. Uh, is the compensation of the patients how to how to differentiate this um, there there are many methods to differentiate the compensation from the abnormalities including uh, also the spatial taste is the one that we can use to differentiate between the compensation and the real pathology like uh, in in patients, uh, for example, like in patients with, with dystonia, when, pa when the patient walk forward, we will notice their abnormalities uh, very, very much more than when they walk backward, uh, which leads us to the diagnosis of task-specific dystonia. This is um, the some of the examples, but, but there are many examples more than that. Uh, the key is to observe in patients in many many uh, situations and also if you if, if you are not sure whether what types or uh, whether is the real abnormalities or not you have to perform the spatial test please any else no question yes Dr. C. Thank you for your interesting presentation. Because every everybody have their out gate, right? So what is the criteria for wide or narrow uh, pace or uh, long or short step, small step? Uh, because uh, we, sometimes we have arguments. Uh, some doctors say it's a small step, but other doctors say it's not, it's normal. So what is criteria for small or abnormal small step? Oh, thank you thank for your very good question. So um, I, I, will, I will divide the answers into two parts. So the first part is, um, is there any uh, numbers for for uh, for you to tell whether it's the short or the long, uh, there's still no consensus 
our of the exact number to tell, but we have um, many, many literatures reviewing in the objective measurement of each type of gait abnormalities, like uh, if the patients with Parkinsonian gait, there are some reviews that uh, tells that patients have uh, the, the step length of about 30, 30 to about 50 centimeters. So, so if you want to um, differentiate between the short uh, or the long or the reduced step height, I recommend that you should compare with uh, the normal healthy people with the same age because uh, if the age changes, the patients are older, the step length and the step height uh, is revealed to be shorter. So when you compare, uh, you want to tell whether the patients have um, the abnormalities of gait or not, you have to compare with the, uh, with the healthy people in the same age. But for the exact number, you can uh, review the literature based on uh, the abnormalities or the disorders. So thank you for the question and uh, the discussion. Uh, and now it, uh, um, it is a time we move to the second phase of our session to, to today. Uh, again, Dr. Warong Pon, Fu and Paton, give us a video-based case discussion on gait disorders. Please, Doctor. Thank you for your great introduction again and, and seeing you again this section. So uh, we are moving to the video-based case discussion on gait disorder. So first, my first case is a 70-year-old male with gait difficulties for four years. So please see his examination at the left compared to the right. Um, any volunteers want to describe some of the gate? <laughs> Just the description would be good, I think. Thank you. Okay. On the left uh, video, I see the patient with uh, uh, difficulty to, uh, in uh, initiating the gait. And uh, when we uh, compare the right step and the left step, the, the left step is longer than the right step mm -hmm. on the left video. But uh, in the right video, we can see the, the longer up step is longer, better with the Mac, laser Mac on the floor. Right. Okay, so, so uh, you are telling that this patient having a short step lane and reduced step height, something like that? Sorry. Uh, okay, uh, okay, thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, thank you. In the video on the left, you see that uh, his trunk leans to the right a little bit. This is a kind of Prisa syndrome, and the base of the gait is narrow. The step length is short, and there is also the reduction of the step height. You see that some of the steps occasionally freeze, and there is also a decrease in the arm swing. Uh, I would like to add further examination of this patient we found that um, he has asymmetrical Parkinsonism more on the right and no weakness is observed. So uh, would, you, would you like to uh, tell me what gait abnormalities does he have? Oh. Which types of gait abnormalities do you think this patient has? Yeah. 
Oh, uh, I, I, I'm going to add add the e. Sorry, Parkinsonian yeah. yes, and I'm question. really sorry. Uh, you can add that for me. I think it's the steep gate. Okay, the the kind of steep gate. Okay. Um. Oh, freezing gate. Okay, freezing of gate. Thank you very much. So uh, I left the E for all the participants to add that for me. Thank you very much. Thank you. Please sit down. Thank you. So this is what we call the freezing of gate, a type of gate which is found along with the Parkinsonian gate in the middle level gate disorders. So there is a clinical spectrum of Parkinsonian gait disorder depends on the stage and the duration of the disease. In the early stage, as in the first patient, she seems to walk normally by observation. You see that? If, if uh, we don't tell that this patient has abnormalities, somebody cannot notice that she really has abnormality. But when we provoke the abnormalities by uh, advise her to perform the spatial test like dual tasking or sometimes counting the numbers while walking, then we see the abnormalities. And for the second video, you see that there is a symmetrical arm swing. This is the progression of the gait disorder. The first two video is the patients with the early Parkinsonian disorder. And the last video is the patients with the late stage. You see that the base of the gate is narrow. The step is short with the low numbers of heel strike. And also there is fascination. What is the fascination? It's a tendency to move forward with increasingly rapidly. And the steps become smaller and smaller associated with the center of gravity because the patient tends to fall. So they have to um, both move their feet very quickly, very rapidly, and sometimes small. In the late stage of PD, some patients may also have freezing. As I said in the previous section, that freezing doesn't occur all the time. So it has various clinical manifestation, depends on the provoked situations, like when patients are at the start, turning, approaching the target, or if severe, patients can have freezing when they walk in an open space. And freezing can occur in different situations in relation to dopaminergic medication. This demonstrates that F4G or freezing is partially involved the dopaminergic system. Of freezing is found in majority. You can see in the left video that freezing improves after we increase the dopaminergic medication. And for the right video is the patient with the on F4G, which means that freezing can be found in both off and on stage. Why we can tell that these patients have on freezing? You see that her upper limb is very fluidity, moves quickly, and sometimes some patients have this kinesia in their upper limb, so you can tell that this patient has on FOG. And for the right video, you see the left video, this patient has freezing of gait. Uh, but you see that after using something, using some devices, the patient uh, has improvement of his gait, right? What is this device? It's a kind of external cues. Cues are non-pharmacological methods to improve patients with freezing of gait. And there are many types of cues, including visual, auditory, or sensory. Each patient responds to each cue differently because the mechanism of action is different. However, there are common mechanisms. Cues improve the attention of patients. The patients pay attention very much to the light of the device. And also 
the compensation enhanced, which preserve the spatial temporal control of the gate. Now, so let's go to the next case. This one, I think um, the video is, is not that difficult. Uh, so any volunteers for, for me to describe? the videos <laughs> and then you can decide uh, whether what abnormalities do they have do you have the answer Uh, we can see here the, the, the left, 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 left of the patient is steep. The foot cannot, uh, there is, there is a stop between the, the foot and the floor. I think generally we can, we can, uh, use the name is the spatted gate. Spatted. Okay. Gate. Um, so, so you think that um, this patient has spatic gait? Uh, is there any abnormal posture of the foot? Is the you can see is the and and what about the the movement of his hip? I can use the, the word is the internal rotation and inversion of the foot. Inversion of the foot. Great, great. <laughs> Thank you very much. So you notice that there is abnormal posturing of left foot and the inversion of the left foot when he walk. You notice that. And uh, I kept the further examination to myself. So I would like to add some of that. Uh, further examination found also the, the asymmetrical Parkinsonism with levodopa response and no weakness is observed. And you notice that uh, the hip of this patient, it is not uh, in the circumduction movement. If we suspect for, for the spastic gait, you have to differentiate between these two with the hip. Uh, if the patients have muscle spasm, then um, he, he hardly lifts the feet and also the, the hip. And then we'll, there will be cir circumduction abnormalities of the hip. There will be things to, to differentiate between these two. So uh, I'll go to which types of gait abnormalities do you think this patient has? Uh, I, I think and well, I heard some whispering. This Tony gait, okay. Thank you very much. So this is what we call the dystonic gait in the middle level gait disorders also. So you see that an early manifestation is the inversion of the foot when the patient walks and the great toe can be flexed or sometimes can be extended. When it worsens, there can be more abnormal posturing at the legs, at the trunk and the arms. And patients may improve when they walk backward, uh, like, like Professor Petriasiri has asked me about um, the kind of compensation. So when the patients walk backward, some, some patients, some patients with uh, mildly dystonia improves. And sometimes running can also be spared. So you see that the abnormalities occur only in the forward position. But if the abnormalities is very severe, 
the dysonia is fixed and you see as kind of uh, abnormal posturing at his foot. So this patient has dystonic gait and we approach the etiology of dystonic gait in the same way as dystonia. It can be classified based on age of onset, body distribution, and also the etiology. So uh, you see here that I compare the old classification and new in this table, and the old one is easier to remember and approach. The etiology can be divided into isolated and combined dystonia in new classification, as you see in the red box. And the etiology of isolated and combined dystonia are subdivided as shown. In this patient, he has dystonia and Parkinsonism, so he would have what we call the combined dystonia, right? And the cause of the patients with dystonia and Parkinsonism will be listed as shown. The dopa-responsive dystonia, the rapid onset dystonia, and the young onset PD. In DRD, the patient will have onset of disease around 20 years old. And for rapid onset dystonia, the progression will be very quick at very young age. And if the patient has YOPD, like in this patient, patient may have foot dystonia and early motor complication. And this compatible with our case. So the cause of dystonia can be also simply classified into primary and secondary dystonia. And because this patient has clinical of Parkinsonism with dystonia compatible with young onset Parkinsonism, his etiology is in the type of secondary dystonia as shown in the red box. And before the end of this case, I'd like to emphasize the red flags of secondary dystonia. In this patient, she has the presence of other neurological or systemic signs, which indicates combined dystonia and leads us to, leads us to the diagnosis of uh, the idiopathic Parkinson's disease. And also combined with um, the neurological signs of asymmetrical Parkinsonism. The next and the last case here is a 50-year-old male with gait difficulties for five years. As I've previously mentioned that sometimes you can tell what disease this patient have since they come into your room. So uh, any volunteers for this video? Thank you very much. Uh, I see uh, this is a patient with a wide base gait and a small step. And uh, it's so hard. Uh, he moves very slowly with the magnetic gait. I think so. I think this, uh, he has the ma magnetic, magnetic gait. Magnetic gait. Yeah. Uh, um, do you notice the postural instability? Uh, you think it's the kind of wide base gate, right? Yeah. Um, but but the postural instability is very distinct. You see that there are two people hanging around the patient. Uh, is there any any type of wide base gate with marked postural instability? Uh, I think that this uh, ataxic gate. Another word. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, so you need notice that this patient has poor balance, and and what you notice is that he has wide base gait. Also, the stepping. You see that the direction and the distance. It's very irregular compared to when normal people walk. It's very irregular and also somewhat dysmetria. And also you will notice that there are purple bags, a purple bag here. It's a urine bag. So this patient has autonomic dysfunction, a sign of autonomic dysfunction. 
this is a, a kind of a taxi gate which what is a taxi gate is a difficulty with motor control which consists of a dysmetria, dysynergy, variability of performance and poor balance and the characters is these 10 characters are irregularity of stepping, irregularity in direction, distance and timing and also you notice the wide base gate. Now moving to the cause of cerebral ataxia, just a short cause. Cause of cerebral ataxia is divided into the acquired and also the genetic cause. If the disease occurred in elderly like this patient, we suspect the acquired cause. In this patient, he has cerebral ataxia, including with the autonomic symptoms and the progression of disease for about five years then it should be considered as the degenerative disease. The common degenerative cerebral ataxia is uh, the MSA. MSA is the type of a typical Parkinsonism and patients may present with cerebral ataxia or Parkinsonism with the red flags of autonomic dysfunction here. And other than cerebral syndrome, like gait ataxia, Limb ataxia, cerebral dysatria, or oculomotor features is one of the core clinical features in update criteria of MSA. And all of you can follow the update MBS criteria as following reference. So before the end of the case discussion, I'd like to emphasize that the middle level gait is very common in general practice. And the characters of each gate abnormalities should be carefully observed in examination because you see that a little bit abnormalities that you notice can lead to the differential diagnosis and the disease of the patients. And early detection of each gate pattern leads to accurate diagnosis and prompt management of the patients. Okay, so next section, we'll have more cases from our colleagues from Lao. And uh, so I would like to, to end my section today and then let's follow the next section with our colleagues. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, there are a question from the participant online for you. I just want to point out that um, what uh, when, when we look at the um, patient gates and we try to differentiate it, um, it's very common that we see the overlap features. I think what you just discussed before, you know, um, um, the potential of it being magnetic, like for example, because you know you observe some of the features that you think is overlapping. Um, but at the end, you know, we see the patient as a whole and we try to decide what are the predominant uh, features in that, like in the head. Like in the last one, what you see, what is quite striking is the upper body sway that is you know, supported by two um, uh, uh, pay, uh, people side by side. So probably that's implied that that is a medial lateral sway quite significantly in that patient combined with the presence of the catheter um, and that is what is thought to be the more ataxic nature uh, per se and the poor foot clearance that might be related to what how patient is trying to compensate it because you know with the fear of falling and the instability of the trunk of, of the upper trunk um, he would be fearful to lift his foot off the ground Yes, uh, the question is, uh, how could we differentiate between step gate and paraparatis gate? Um, for the characters of the stiff leg, uh, you see that uh, there, like, like Professor has said, that there are some types of gait that has overlapping features, uh, like these two gait abnormalities from the questions, the paraparatic gait and also the stiff gait, there are overlapping features like a reduced step height. So sometimes, um, sometimes some people can, can misunderstand the observation. Uh, but 
the things that will help would be the movement fluidity. Uh, but it's not 100%. So you need further neurological examination also. Uh, the movement fluidity in um, the patients with the with the stiff gait, with the stiff gait, uh, will be decreased. But in the patients with uh, the paraparatic gait, the movement fluidity will be uh, the same. Or sometimes uh, it's not markedly decreased. You can um, differentiate between these two with two things. So um, the movement fluidity, the first one, and the second one is further neurological examination. Uh, you see that um, the paraparatic gait, the, the main abnormalities would be the weakness and also the hyperreflexia. If it's the upper motor neuron weakness. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. And uh, I uh, also asked you a question. Uh, how do you uh, differentiate between the uh, cerebellar ataxigay and frontal ataxigay? Frontal and cerebellar? Yeah. Oh, yes. Uh, so um, the distinct feature, uh, at first, uh, we are coming to, to the partial physiology between these two. Uh, the frontal gait disorder uh, is caused by the abnorm abnormalities of the frontal gait, right? So uh, the abnormalities between these two start from, from the first phase of gait, from the gait initiation at first. Uh, the frontal gait disorders will be slow. There, there will be slow gait initiation. And also the step of the patient will be uh, reduced. There will be short step length. The patient hardly lift the feet from the floor. And also the stance of uh, the base is wide, but with, with um, the correlation of the abnormalities I have mentioned. So you notice that uh, they, are, they are not the same. If the patients have cerebellar ataxia, the initiation will be good not so bad because there are no abnormalities at the frontal cortex. And then when you walk, there are dysmetria of the steps. It's the distinction from, from the pathophysiology if you don't want to remember the abnormalities of each one. Uh, yes, so the last, uh, the, the last case, do you think that case is the uh, frontal ataxy gate? It's not cerebellar gate. Because the patient have the uh, the the pace uh, uh, wide and uh, uh, slow um, step and uh, 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 slow movement, uh, uh, something like a frontal ataxy gait. Yes. Than yes. Uh, but thank you. Uh, I think that I think that you mentioned a very good point because, uh, like like. Uh, some have already mentioned that we have to differentiate between these two. There are also overlapping features. And also, uh, we can confirm whether this patient uh, ha has each type of abnormalities with also the, the other neurological examination. It, like if you want to confirm that this patient has cerebral ataxia or not, you can perform the other neurological examination. Right. I think I think I think it's it's a good point also. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much again. And uh, we would like to invite uh, Dr. Abason Paumin for your uh, presentation case discussion. Uh, Dr. Abason uh, Famin is a neurologist uh, from uh, Setan Tiras uh, Hospital, University of Health Science, Laos. Thank you very much for your kind introduction. Xin chào. Hello, everyone. <laughs> My name is Abason Pumin. I am a neurologist from Laos. Currently, I am a first year movement disorder at Jula-Longkorn Center of Excellence for, for Parkinson's disease and related disorder. 
This is going to be my first talk on international states. So I would like to take this opportunity to express my appreciation to the organizing committee for having me here today. I am going to start my talk by showing you some video of the patients that you already may have seen. So this is like um, the post test that you're going to have. These two patients came to clinic because of having a gait difficulty plus cognitive decline for more than a year. And these two patients have a specific gait pattern. It seems that they all have gait difficulties, in other words, gait disorder. So what is gait disorder and what pattern of gait do they have? Gait disorders are common disorders that usually found in all adults and increase by age. For the group of 60 to 69 year olds, it can be seen about 10%. But at the age of 55 or more, it can be seen up to 82%. If you take a look at this flow chart, when patients have gait disorder that relate to age, falls always occur. When patients experience falls, it's always followed by either immobility, injury, or a fear of falling that cause them to end up with morbidity, quality of life decrease, and mortality. Gait disorder are very complex. This presentation will follow the classification of Nutt, Martin, and Thompson proposed in 1993, and it had been commonly used. There are three classifications of gait disorder, namely lowest level gait disorder, middle level gait disorder, and highest level gait disorder. The first two classifications have already been discussed by Dr. Valong Pon, so I am going to talk only about highest level gait disorder. Highest level gait disorder is a malfunction of the cerebral hemisphere and include disorder arising from psychiatric origin. These disorders are not completely distinct from each other, so patients may have more than one characteristic and may progress from one to another. There are many subtypes such as cautious gait, frontal gait disorder, frontal disequilibrium, isolated gait initiation failure, subcortical disequilibrium, and psychogenic or functional gait. This is the figure showing a relationship of the three different subtypes arising from frontal lobe dysfunction. Frontal gait disorder, frontal disequilibrium, and isolated gait initiation failure are frequently difficult separate from each other and might be considered very presentations of a frontal lobe dysfunction as they can overlap by time. For example, patients can first present with gait aplasia and later shuffling, freezing of gait and poor balance can be seen. The common gait pattern in all adults are frontal gait disorder, cautious gait, and psychogenic gait. I'm going to discuss with this pattern in my presentation. I think some of all of you have already seen this video. Uh, can anyone help me to uh, tell to talk about the phenomenology of these patients? This is like the post test. This is a patient of a 15 years old female who has cognitive decline for one year and have gait difficulty as you can see on the video. Can anyone tell me her phenomenology and the side that you see? Yeah, this is a very good video that's contrasting with what Barong Pond uh, shown in the last page and actually. Let's try again. Thank you. Uh, I see that uh, this patient have a uh, wide base gait, uh, small step, and uh, normal upswing. And um, the history patient have a uh, cognitive decline for one year. Uh, yeah. I think this patient have a uh, magnetic gait and the uh, MP heart maybe a uh, diagnosis for this patient. Yes. Thank you very much. That is the correct answer. Dr. Wolong Huan is very happy. <laughs> this is the magnetic gait. 
and you can be seen in frontal gait disorder. Frontal gait disorder is most common pattern in highest level gait disorder. It looks like Parkinsonic gait at the patient present with short, sharply step, poor balance, initiation failure, hesitate on turn. This is called magnetic gait. But you, but if you have a look at the other book, or maybe people other might um, discuss as the March Appetipa or aplasia of gait. To differentiate with the Parkinson disease, uh, this kind of pattern, patients do not have the abnormality on the upper limb. There is, there is no tremor, tremor, and most importantly, there is no response to levodopa. This kind of pattern is called lower half Parkinsonism or lower body Parkinsonism. This is common differential diagnostic of frontal lobe dysfunction categorized by different etiologies such as vascular, pressure-related, neurodegenerative, autoimmune, and neoplasm. The most common and had been studied the most is normal pressure hydrocephalus and frontal temporal dementia. Normal pressure hydrocephalus is first described by Hakim and Adam in 1965 as a ventricular megaly with normal CSF pressure. There are three important signs and symptoms, gait disturbance, progressive cognitive decline, and urinary incontinence. There is no diagnostic task for NPH, but there are some supportive tasks. The recommended brain imaging is MRI with CSF flow study. If the MRI is not available, just like in my practice in my country, MRI is not available in every hospital, so CT scan is also helpful. Plus the event index to calculate the maximum width of fronton horn, then divide by the measure of the inner table at the same place and it should be greater than 0 0.3. For easily understand, A divided B should be greater than 0 0.3. The best task that should be performed is TAP task. It helps in the diagnostic the NPH. In addition, is it the best predictor to the, of the response to the shunt surgery that is an effective treatment for NPH. TAP task is a lumbar puncture to remove 30 to 50 ml of CSF and observe the change in gait and cognition. If it is responsive, shunt surgery can be indicated. The surgery has a clinical response to 30 to 90% and gait disturbance is a clinical symptom most likely to respond to uh, this surgery. Now let's move to another video. Can anyone help me to describe the phenomenology of the patients and the sign that he has? This is a 70 years old male present with um, cognitive decline and get difficulty for a year. Can anyone? The post test. I think he presented very well. Uh, yeah, okay. In this video, we, uh, we see a, a man with a narrow, narrow space, small tap, and when the patient walking the narrow space, uh, the gate is, uh, we, call, uh, we call it freezing up gate, freezing up gate. And he must use some cues to, to help him to uh, overcome the, mm, that narrow, narrow space. Do, okay. you, do you see other side? Uh, sorry, when, when he tried to walk to the door, what happened? Uh, in, it's the nar narrow, sp uh, na narrow, narrow space and small step when, yes. he, when, when he tried to over overcome the narrow space. Yes, that's correct. Um, when he tried to pass the door, yes. he has some target hesitations that induce the freezing, a little bit in uh, freezing of gait. So these patients when we do the brain imaging, he has the frontal temporal dementia. Frontal temporal dementia is first reported by Arnold Pick in 1892 as a clinical syndrome associated to frontal temporal lobe. FGD is the fourth common dementia behind Alzheimer's disease, vascular dementia, and dementia with Levy body. It affects 1 to 16% of patients with dementia. Unlike Alzheimer's disease, 
FGD over occur at middle age adult as age at onset is between 45 to 64 years old. That is up to 60%. 10 to 15% appear to inherit in an autosomal dominant. And the three mutation genes are MAPT, GRN, and C9ORF72. There are two subtypes. By have viral variant is the most variant, nearly 60%. And the, and the other one is primary progressive aphasia, that is about 40%. The PPA is divided into three subtypes, semantic variant, non fluent agrammatic variant, and locopenic variant. When this is proclassed, gate disturbance can be seen in every subtype. Now moving to another example of gate pattern. By watching this video, can some of you tell me what is this sign? You already seen this video before. You have you have the privilege of picking the next one. <laughs> Are we picking the next one? Yeah, yes. you can pick the next one. You have the privilege. Uh, 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 yes, I think this uh knee buckling. That is correct. Yes. That is knee buckling. How about the second one? Oops. Can anyone help me? Um, uh, I see the, the patient uh, had wise pay uh, gait and uh, the, um, the arm swinging are normal and uh, he has um, maybe stoop, uh, stoop uh, posture. Uh, Maybe I guess the the day, uh, diagnosis is um a toxic a toxic uh, gait. That is very good answer. Actually, uh, the first the per the first patients um present with the knee giving away. This is the uh, knee buckling, and the second patient present with broad base step with decreased stride length and height. This term is called walking on ice, and these two pattern can are seen in psychogenic or functional gait disorder. This is the seven feature of psychogenic or functional gait disorder initially elaborated by Lampert. The most common feature is knee buckling, walking on ice, that is a mimic ice skating or as if on slippery ground. The other common side was highlighted in the red color. I would like to end up my presentation by taking home message. It is very common in all adults to have gait disorder, and it is increased by age. It could be seen up to 82% at the age of 55 and more. Gait disorder induced falls. Patients who end up having a lower quality of life, or in worst case, it increased mortality rate. There are many gait patterns in highest level gait disorder, Thus, they are crew to help in differentiate or diagnostic subtype. And this is very, very important to identify subtype and manage by each cause because it could help in fall prevention. Last but not least, I please remind that the early detect gait disorders cause can help in fall prevention and promoting better quality of life for patients. So thank you. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Come in. Uh, thank you, Dr. Abason Fawmin, for your presentation. Uh, do you have any question and comment? Just, just have a quick comment here. Um, I don't know if, if the audience um, have the problem like when I used to be um, a junior doctor and the resident, that when I see all these videos, I confuse. I was confused with all the terminology used in the literature. Because when you go back to the literature, Many of them are quite old, and many of them are descriptive. So you encounter um, the, 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 the description 
of various source of the cars, and sometimes you get confused. Like for example, you see frontal ataxia. What does it mean? Is that frontal or is it ataxic? Um, get ataxia, frontal ataxia. How could the frontal lobe be ataxic? Something like that, or subcortical disequilibrium gait of the elderly. Sometimes runes ataxia and so on. And I think that um, I just want uh, um, you know the audience to realize that um, these are from the old literature and they are descriptive. And with the advances in the investigation and technology, particularly uh, with the neural imaging. Uh, those has been classified. So, you know, I, I mean, for me, I think it's easier to go by the classification. And once we go by the classification, we can match it with the description. And I think that you will understand uh, more like uh, why that happened. Like when you realize that higher level gait disorder, like a frontal, um, they walk like that, what we discussed, you would not be confused at why they call it apraxia which is not indeed not epoxic at all, it's a misnomer, but it has been used from old days, so it has so it's continued to be used, to be described, yeah. Just a comment. Th thank you. Uh, any comment and questions? Uh, okay, I, I, want, I have one question for Dr. Abbasson. Uh, because you uh, in your presentation you said that a uh, knee buck, buckling knee knee buckling gay um, maybe it's a functional gay disorder, but in some patients with negative myoclonus in post of that, like that, they may have the a knee buckling gay, and therefore is there any specific other size for distinguish uh, those uh, uh, those in the functional gay or negative myoclonus in post of that, that the patient like. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the questions. Since um, I don't have much experience on the uh, gait uh, disorder, may I pass this question to our gait expert, Dr. Valong Thorn, to help me? That is a very good question, though. Oh, okay. uh, so, <laughs> Uh, yes, you, you mentioned a very good point that um, some patients, uh, like you mentioned, in patients with myoclonus, right? Or, oh, okay, the negative myoclonus and the knee buckling. So um, the ne negative myoclonus will be uh, characterized by is um, you have to, to do some postures and then you see the lap, you, we call it the lapping lapping of um of the movement but uh in patients with knee buckling um is a very uh typical form of patients uh, with psychosis disorders but but in patients with negative myoclonus there are some types of gait too if i mean that if you differentiate between only the negative myoclonus and and only only the knee buckling you have to see the lapping features of the myoclonus that will, that will help you to uh, differentiate between these two. But in patients with negative myoclonus, they have uh, some types of abnormalities that can um, be present into the what we call bouncing gait. Yes, uh, if the patients have negative myoclonus, uh, if the negative myoclonus occurs in the lower limb, not the not only the upper limb, like we usually found that. Uh, the gait will be called the bouncing gait. Yes, the bouncing gait, uh, not not like this type. This is only um when the patients like we call it the black buckling, only like um suddenly fall something like that. But the bouncing gait is like uh, somewhat we call the dancing gait, like the patients bounce and sometimes dance. And we will have to differentiate that with uh, the Corey gate also. <laughs> but 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 uh, to to say to to say simply, you can differentiate simply simply differentiate that with um, the maneuvers like like what I've told you are uh, the lapping phenomenon. And also, if you want to to uh, see the gait disorders of patients with myoclonus, you will you will have to. Uh, Notice the bouncing gate. 
Maybe we're on point uh, tomorrow. You can put the video side by side, actually, between that um, knee blocking and the bouncing gate. I think that we quite uh, show the contrast because in that bouncing gate is a whole axial that is involved. And you can see that it goes together like that. And once the upper part is involved, uh, usually patients have this type of instability and they require the cavity to support them. And you can see that the knee bucking is very different. Sometimes it's quite almost like estasia evasi when I mean, you do like that, but um, it's not exactly the same. But um, you see that it's just the lower part is more involved. Why the upper body, you know, spray and the patient's feet are able to maintain without the knee. Foot correction. Oh, the patient didn't do any foot correction. Uh, there is a question for Professor Ron Roy uh, from the participant online. Yes. <laughs> Yes. Uh, what do you What do you do for MSI with uh, laryngeal strider in real practice? Uh, do you think about RTMS for MSI? Or uh, the treatment for the laryngeal strider? You mean? Yes. Okay. Um. This um. This is very important question actually because the strider once occur is a poor prognostic uh, risk factors in patient with MSA. And it has been demonstrated to shorten uh, uh, disease survival in those who have that stridor. However, the, the confirmation of the you know, stridor in, in MSA patients, particularly in the early stage, could be quite difficult because it's usually started in the nighttime. And the daytime, the patients might look perfect. So, you know, they, the carer may say that, oh, you heard something, you know, abnormal breathing sound at night. And during the day, you know, the patient just fine. You refer the patient for the ENT examination and they report it back normal. And I, and I encounter this type of problem again and again. So in, in those who really suspect it, we need to do the uh, video stro stroboscopic study during the nighttime uh, with, um, with the monitoring. And usually we documented those type of strider. But it's quite difficult to do it in clinical practice, actually. So what I tend to do in practice is that if highly suspected, I usually, you know, ask the family to do the camera at home. It's quite easy, actually. Nowadays, the device is quite cheap. And they do the, you know, put on the, the, the home camera and, and do the monitoring for a few days, bring the video to us. If we highly suspect that, we actually show it to the, you know, to the ENT doctor. This is what how the patient encounter during the nighttime, and I usually, you know, brings the patient to do the monitoring at night in the hospital. Um, uh, if if those is highly suspected, now if the patient who have the stridor during the daytime is not much of a problem because you can confirm it. You know, sometimes you know, I heard the patients in the waiting room they have this abnormal breathing stuff and you know we actually spotted it and then refer the patient for their proper treatment. So the treatment per se for those stridor, I think is it is challenging because um because ideally ideally the, um, the treatment of choice eventually for those patients is tracheostomy. But um to do that you know not many family really really want to um uh you know accept that so sometimes you try to do whether, you know, if that could be due to the dystonia, if it is dystonia, could that be, um, would bottom toxin be helpful and so forth. But in that sense, you know, in, in, in practical purposes, I find it's very difficult, um, you know, to, to risk the patient to try with the toxin injection and so forth. So, you know, I usually try to document it. And if the patient who have these severe symptoms have those stridor, they actually, the, the, the treatment of choice is actually uh, a tracheostomy. Um, and, and that has been shown to prolong survival, actually, in the patient with MSA. Dr. Srinkian, you have something to add? You're the nighttime doctor. 
I totally agree with you. <laughs> and we can disagree. You another can one, uh, another choice for the managed of patient with dry dog sometimes or uh, might be we recommend the con or CPAP, CPAP, the continuous pressure to to use during the night time. It might be a little bit help in, in the patient who don't want to perform the tracheostomy. Because but I'm not quite sure if the CPAP has been shown to prolong survival in the, no, yeah. I think no and, no evidence for the prolonged survival. And, and those with the stride dog, you know, since it is a life threatening complication, uh, sometimes you know, want to do something more definite because I thought that it would be life saving for the patient. Usually patients who have these type of problems, they are more advanced um the stage of the MSA, for example. Um and, and they like uh, already some of them already a phonic, for example, they hardly be able to talk, so maybe trichostomy is a life saving for them. Maybe another uh, study that uh, said that if you uh, cannot find the evidence of the stride or dealing away, sometimes they scope under the anesthesia and make it more sensitive for detection of the stride or. Yep, that's right. But I like the home technology nowadays, you know, with home devices and things, it's very easy to monitor patients at nighttime and it's not that expensive. You ask, you know, the, the, the son or daughter to set up the camera and then you actually see it in the, within a couple of weeks, they bring the camera to us, the, the clip to us, oh my God, this is quite striking. What now, uh, clinical practice, uh, some case with mild and moderate uh, uh, severity, and I also use uh, CPAP, uh, and the patient uh, uh, will uh, useful for the short term, uh, three months or six months, yes. <laughs> Any questions? Yes, uh, we had a long day for very interesting uh, presentation, and uh, I think it's very helpful for for us uh, to to learn about. And uh, I think uh, it's time to stop today. And uh, tomorrow we will meet together at uh, eight thirty, uh, also in this room. Uh, one again, once again, thank you very much for the participant. Uh, thank you. Uh, Dr. Tran, just to um, maybe if you could mention to the audience that there are some some questions that's left unanswered, and we're going to answer them tomorrow. <laughs>